Welcome everybody. I'm glad uh, the conversations are going, but I'll be able to talk. So um, it's been a while since we've had a talk in person. So welcome back. It feels good. Um, so today we uh, are so pleased that we have an issue uh, who you know well, the Philosophy Institute, and that's the specialty of the science. And uh, as you know, we go from one month today. She uh, she came to us from uh, Columbia University and then before that MIT uh, School of Planning and Architecture. And uh, she works at the intersection of the social sciences, urban planning, and data. So I think that talk will have bring those elements together in this particular example of studying web learning. So let's see. Like, um, thank you so much. Just take the mic. Great. Thanks, Denise. Um, and thanks, for attending this school camp. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about a working paper titled, uh, Where Did Redlining Matter? Regional Heterogeneity and Beyond the Evidence of Advantage. Um, please feel free to ask questions throughout if something is unclear. Um, this is the first time that I'm talking about this research. So um, there might be, yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so this paper studies the regional variation in outcomes of federal home mortgage insurance rating to highlight the contingent discriminatory and economic conditions that contribute to the health. So, um, this study aims to clarify and standardize and by implication homogenous federal neighborhood valuation principle nevertheless has heterogeneous outcomes across the US. So essentially I wanna understand the intra-city and regional heterogeneity of redlining's relative advantage. So here I'm building off of ideas from Ed Getz, Rashad Williams, and Tony Damiano that we've understudied the relative advantages of whiteness. And this prevents us from developing a fuller picture of the impacts of urban planning and prevention. Uh, so I'll briefly go over um, the uh, today's talk. Um, I'm going to go over the background and the conceptual framework for this topic, um, my research questions and hypotheses, the data and methods I use, and then lastly, uh, results. I think we're part of a larger investigation into the ecosystem of our mining practices. Uh, despite the prevalence of redlining in the general discourse, I think most of these articles are from the last few weeks. Um, until recently, these practices haven't been quantitatively examined, especially not at a national scale. Um, that's because most of the redlining data hasn't really been available. So as a consequence, this is a practice where much about the specific mechanisms are misunderstood and much remains unresolved in terms of where the specific impacts lay. So first, a little bit of background. Um, so the Federal Housing Administration was created in 1935 to provide government guarantees on new mortgages to encourage home ownership in the United States. So from 1935 to 1962, the uh, FHA insured 6.4 million new single-family homes nationwide. So the overall U.S. home ownership rate increased to about 65 percent um, in 1995 from about i think 40 percent in 1940 as a consequence of what was essentially a government subsidy to homeowners uh, so the ma majority of new loans went to new construction in primarily suburban subdivisions however within the city boundaries i want to figure out who and which areas benefited more from this market and of course, we're all familiar with the HOLC redlining maps in terms of their A, B, C, and D grades. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 the map on the left here are not the real redlining maps. Um, uh, that's a previous paper that I wrote, uh, and I won't really get into the details of that here. The relevant information is that um, mortgages with an A uh, or a B grade were allowed a 20 plus year or a 10 to 20 year mortgage, 
term, which is quite good, while C and D areas were considered more risky and were either given a five to 10 year uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage guarantee term or no mortgage guarantees at all. Uh, and I'm primarily interested in this period between 1940 and 1970, which are the main decades that the FHA was active. Uh, so in my analysis, which I'll talk about later, I'm also looking at the period, um, the decades before 1940, to kind of understand the landscape of um, housing and socioeconomic conditions um, and racial dynamics before FHA intervention. And these may have influenced uh, you know, variation in um, in FHA uh, So before I dive into the background properly, I'd kind of like to lay out the conceptual framework of how I think federal law mining influences outcomes that forms kind of the foundations of this paper, but I don't necessarily tease out um, in the analysis. So I propose that there are three channels through which federal redlining by the federal housing units created or perpetuated racial and socioeconomic stratification in housing outcomes over time. Um, so the first directly relates to lending activities or the lack thereof. The latter two relate to the FHA's role in cementing or amplifying existing discriminatory practices. So number one, uh, the provisioning of loan guarantees based on neighborhood ratings had a direct impact in bolstering better rated A and B neighborhoods with more credit and new construction. And so this also bolstered the ability of these residents in these neighborhoods to own homes. Um, two, well, that, that, I think they also, well, the FHA did also explicitly encourage the use of racial covenants and other tools of the private real estate industry in their underwriting activities. So you actually could get a higher credit score with the FHA if your house was covenant. So even though covenants were made illegal uh, or legally unenforceable in Shelley versus in 1968, the FHA actually continued to encourage or did not dissuade the use of covenants for only two decades. So the objective could be to perpetuate uh, neighborhood stratification along socioeconomic and racial lines especially in areas that saw more FHA activity. When then, ben, do you mind just explaining a little bit the, the thoughts of the co uh, covenants, how they were developed and how they were in? Sure. Essentially, a racial covenant is a private agreement. Um, generally, it is um, uh, uh, created when a, when a subdivision or subdevelopment is built. So an entire community in the suburbs will, have, will be racially covenanted. And that means that you can't, you are most likely a white uh, homeowner and you cannot resell your home to uh, a minority um, home buyer. So that kind of maintains the, uh, the socioeconomic and racial homogeneity. It's a private agreement. It's a private agreement, exactly. It, it is an instrument uh, that is used by private developers. Uh, so then number three, uh, I also propose that the FHA's underwriting manual, which was this big uh, guide that they had on how to, um, how to score uh, different, loan, uh, different loans, that this underwriting manual set the mortgage and lending practices for the rest of the mortgage industry. So that also includes other lending institutions that didn't, uh, didn't use FHA loan guarantees, such as late, uh, saving the loan association. And these were the other kind of dominant institutional lenders during the same mid 20th century period. And this actually provided the majority of mortgage guarantees for city residents. Yeah. I'm interested in the mechanisms that you have in mind for especially the second point here. Um, you alluded to the idea that also when, uh, when a borrower is able to borrow for a home, then they can leverage that to borrow more. Was that part of your idea? But then also you were talking about the homogeneity of the, of the neighborhood as well. So how do you see uh number two working through the process yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure that borrowers leverage the loan to borrow more i think most of these borrow most of these loans were for middle class residents who yeah. are using their loans 
not really as kind of like investment properties, but for their own. Yeah. Um, and so the so getting an FHA loan actually made it cheaper than like renting. So number two is not a financial mechanism, it's rather like a homogeneity and cutting people out of parts of the housing market. Yeah. It's restricting of housing supply. It's a restricting of housing supply, but I, you know, but, but part of the, there was this kind of ideology that maintaining a racial homogeneity also maintain the value or increase the value of the home. So, I mean, I'm not talking about that here right now, but if you look at, you know, some of the wording on the covenants and, stuff, and the way that some of these homes are advertised, they, you know, they talk about these developments are all white. Your home is cheap now. It will, you know, skyrocket in value in yeah. the future because, uh, because of the, homo the homogeneity of uh, mm -hmm. these. Um, so I argue that kind of through these last two points, the impacts of you know, FHA redlining had, you know, was amplified beyond their own activity. Okay. So, okay, since I'm interested in the kind of heterogeneity of these outcomes, here I propose you know, four varying scales and types of factors that might influence this homogeneity. So number one, there was just a lot faster urban growth and construction in Sunbelt cities kind of during the same period of FHA's intervention. Uh, two, there were existing patterns of racially explicit zoning, primarily in the South. And these patterns might have um, kind of settled you know, racial and socioeconomic stratification pre-FHA and essentially reduced the necessity of this movement. Um, three, we should consider the areas within the city, which actually had suburban-like housing developments. Um, and so these are probably going to, uh, the prevalence of these suburban-like developments within the city is probably going to kind of follow the factors from that first point. And then lastly, despite um, kind of standardized federal policy, we know that the implementation of the policy actually had kind of documented idiosyncrasy. So I'll just kind of go over what I mean by each of these points. So first we know that there was a shifting of industrial activity from the Northeast and Midwest to Sunbelt cities during and after World War II when defense-related industries catalyzed urban growth in these West Coast and Southwestern cities. So Tom Segrew calls this the movement from the Rust Belt to the Sunbelt. Um, if we look at population change during this area, it becomes more clear, you can see from this map here, um, the, population, the population change between 1940 and 1950 uh, happened in, uh, for most of the states that saw more than a 25% population growth, these are kind of Sun Belt and Pacific Coast states, and also Florida, which I think is a Sun Belt, or Sun Belt. Uh, and of course, um, in the second wave of the Great Migration, there was also a similar uh, massive migration of Black residents from the South to more urban, but also Black Palestinians. Technically, that's how urban growth. Uh, faster urban growth in the South uh, of area, there was also new construction. So this table shows the proportion of homes that were built after 1940 by the 1950 census. And you can see that here, the kind of the highest proportions are, again, in the Sun Belt and Pacific areas. And consequently, um, this affected FHA uh, insurance. So this is a table from the FHA's 29th annual report showing home mortgage insurance, home mortgage insurance volumes by state in 19, uh, this is from 1935 to 1954. You can see that, for instance, I don't know if you can actually see these numbers, but I'll just read them out. I'll just tell you. Uh, so California had close to 3.8 million new homes insured, while Massachusetts had about 132,000. So if we use a 1950 census population as our denominator, that's about one new home for approximately every three people in California. Um, and then one, uh, uh, one new home for every 35 people in Massachusetts. So there's Obviously, you know, the, the FHA activity was 
Can you give us a sense where these homes are being built within cities? Because this is a little bit before the car. So maybe that's exactly yeah. what you're going to show us. Uh, yes, maybe I'll just actually I'll, I will go to my last slide. Um, so I think that Los Angeles is like a great example for a lot of the dynamics that I um, that I'm interested in. And Los Angeles was a city that was kind of rapidly um, building at this time, expanding at this time, also saw a lot of uh, uh, land annexation in the early 20th century, we'll talk about in a second. But a lot of, so a lot of these homes, um, Los Angeles saw a lot of kind of new construction, uh, new urban growth in the kind of uh, much later than, you know, for instance, some, uh, so for instance, um, this is a description of a B-graded neighborhood in, from, uh, in Los Angeles, so city proper. And so this is a description from 1939. This is in Rancho Park at the intersection of People Boulevard and o Overland Avenue and is described as thus. Um, this area was subdivided and placed in the market some 15 years ago, but has experienced its greatest activity during the past five years. Much of the new development has been the result of FHA finance. Architectural designs are harmonious. The population is homogenous. So, um, so because of the city's kind of rapid growth during a, uh, that occurred kind of concurrently with the heyday of the FHA's kind of lending activities. So we can kind of plausibly argue that, you know, uh, redlining or kind of getting a better grade in this neighborhood was more important, had a greater benefit to the neighborhood than say, for instance, uh, a neighborhood in West Cambridge, Massachusetts, also graded B. Um, so this neighborhood, I, I don't have a map of this here, is described this way. So properties are very well held with very few offered for sale at any time. Um, although somewhat old, this section continues to be one of the more desirable neighborhoods in Cambridge. So essentially what I'm trying to argue is that, you know, there were areas that were, I mean, amongst other factors, areas like this neighborhood in Los Angeles will be kind of much more affected by redlining than a similarly graded area in Cambridge, where although it still received the same grade, the importance of this grade is perhaps less because there was just not a lot of new construction or new and consequently new loans happening in this area. Does that make sense? Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe get to this, but are you gonna, do you have fine grain data on the number of loans by neighborhood? So you no. kind of have to back that out because I'm. I guess yeah. it's a puzzle to understand like why do we care about the new construction rate when we can just observe the number of new loans and see. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Way. Yeah. That would be. Um, that would be the ideal data set to have. But unfortunately, like loan data or mortgage data is usually available at like the municipal level. So in order to kind of collect that information, you have to do a lot of archival work. And so the best proxy that we, and I will kind of show some more information about like state level uh, metropolitan loan issuance, but um, kind of with a lot of this historical data, unless you kind of dig into the you know, individual archives, it's kind of, um, unfortunately you're kind of left with having to use the kinds of data or the Right. And your census proxy is going to be like a quantification of the number of new census proxy units? is going to be home ownership and home and like the change in home value. Okay. Yeah. Is it fair to think of this then as a treatment that's being applied to neighborhoods, but it's only treating the mechanism of like your list of three mechanism one and maybe number two? Three, I'm trying to remember what number two was, but like the, for example, the homogeneity number two is something that affects the whole neighborhood, regardless of if you own your property or if you, uh, or if you're moving in or rent. But like ultimately, then I'm thinking about like who are the outside groups that might be within the neighborhood and untreated by the loan policy, and it would be like incumbent homeowners and renters 
who will face other forms of discrimination, but like won't be the, this mechanism of loneliness for us. So it's it's kind of in line with Jared's comment about like you know who's who's being treated and like at what stage like are they taking out loans or are you know a turnover into the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think maybe that's also one of that's one of the kind of the limitations is that you can't really look at who's being treated, but you can only kind of look at the neighborhood level. You can really only look at neighborhood level in this case, like you know, with racial composition or housing outcomes. It would be, yeah, I mean, ideally we would kind of follow the borrower or follow the loan. Yeah, although percent homeowner versus renter is something, I, I mean, I think you're going to pick up effects on both because of discrimination against renters as well, but it would be a different mechanism. Like it's, it tells a little bit of a different story if you look at like high renter neighbors, neighborhoods versus homeowners. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and actually, I think that like, I, I think that that, Rent is something that's not looked at enough or kind of looking at instead of, you know, instead of getting a loan, kind of how that affects rental, like rental uh, housing is not something that's, that should be looked at more. Um, yeah, I think one last thing for yeah. the, like the outcome we should think about is like whether in a place like LA, the racial composition, um, remains is kind of like more affected by the redlining map than in a place like Cambridge, like in terms of change in racial composition, that's the kind of outcome. Yeah, so I'm only looking at home home values and home ownership here. Um, but essentially, yeah, so I'll describe. Okay, yeah. perfect, sorry. It's, it's fine. Sorry, a technical question. Can yes. you put it full screen so that- I, How do I make it full screen? I, I I would love to make it bigger um, or kind of like the more. options if you see on the top. top. No, I'll keep if you go to presentation mode when you're typing, it does it. Should you just double click on the yeah, okay. image? You options up the top. The right. right to the right, yeah. <clears throat> Can you see the text? Barely. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry. The view options may give you an option. It's there when you move the mouse. You can move the mouse. Yeah, move the mouse up to the reading. If you first move the mouse. Okay, let me, yeah, oh, there. Are Look. Yeah. Oh, you can't see on your own oh, screen. Right. Well, up to Zoom meeting. Whoa, what just happened? <laughs> 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 I think if you just double click on the video, it should be yeah. yeah. oh, okay. yeah. 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 like the last one. I mean, I think just about the line. There we go. Oh, yes. Yeah. There. Any difference? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's just the like, full screen. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Everyone was talking about was. No, sorry, it's Amy. It's oh, there. That's your yeah, help. No, He's no, right here now. Should maybe be more Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry that I called this. <laughs> We're all taking it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's better. That's better. Thanks, 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 Than
good in case people say they can't hear or et cetera. So you just watch your time. Distracting. Okay. Um, all right. So should we should we move on? Yeah. Okay. Um so <coughs> second, I'm arguing that because there are kind of existing patterns of explicit explicit racial zoning, especially in the South, um, that this is going to affect um this is going to affect outcomes. Um in the sense that uh well. First of all, you know when when racial when racial zoning was legal. So this was actually between 1910 and 1917. 27 cities passed racial zoning ordinances. All but one was in the south. So we know that this is a phenomenon that was occurring primarily in that part of the country. And essentially, what I'm arguing is that because there were kind of extent. Um, policies, uh, housing discrimination policies in place that perhaps this new tool is going to be less effective in kind of stratifying neighborhoods along those uh, uh, dimensions. Um, third, we know um, the homogenous kind of single family residential community came to fruition by the 1940s. So uh, though this housing and planning model was introduced by private developers, it was actually actively supported by the FHA not only through these kind of racial covenants, um, but it's also also it's kind of stringent requirements for housing design that kind of favored these single family typologies. Uh, so this pattern of development was not strictly confined to the suburbs, uh, partially because what was considered central city was kind of continually evolving as city limits expanded and suburban annexations um, happened in the mid 20th century. Um, so for instance, Los Angeles is a salient example. The bulk of the city's annexations happened in the late 20th century. For a lot, again, a lot of these kind of East Coast or Midwestern cities, this type of annexation happened uh, earlier in the 19th century. And so we would expect areas um, like Los Angeles to have a lot more kind of new undeveloped land by around 1940. And I should note that this kind of expansion, this kind of suburban type of expansion was not exclusive to some belt cities. So um, this is a map of, this is Chicago's FHA map. And this is a map of private residential construction from 1940 to 1944. Um, I'll just kind of point out that essentially the area that saw the most um, private residential construction in Chicago are kind of at these suburban like edges of the city which incidentally are where a lot of the kind of A and B graded neighborhoods from this FHA, FHA map are. Um, and then lastly, we know that there was a lot of kind of idiosyncratic implementation of policy at the level of the city. So describing the attempt by real estate professionals to implement standardized national practices Paige Glotzer describes realtors as making daily, often inconsistent decisions about exclusions based on local conditions. And not only did <coughs> realtors influence how national legislation was implemented, but the FHA's uh, local offices were given autonomy to, for instance, uh, resist strict adherence to new legislation or to willful, willfully neglect implementation of anti-discriminatory measures, such as this 1948 Shelley versus Kramer decision to outlaw racial covenants. Uh, so in terms of my research questions, I um, the study is a descriptive analysis that, uh, that tries to paint a clearer picture of outcomes and its possible mechanisms. So I have three questions. The first in terms of the landscape of housing stratification before the FHA's intervention. So what were the economic and population um, from 1910 to 1930, and how may this have shaped loan guarantee patterns or FHA loan guarantee patterns? Uh, number two, and this is the main question that I'm interested in. So between 1940 and 1970, what were what was the degree of the FHA's influence as proxied by HLC maps? 
on A and B graded neighborhoods versus uh, a riskier C graded neighborhood in different cities, how does this influence a change or persist over time? Uh, number three, I'm interested in this kind of per the persistence of this influence over time and what might be some explanatory factors. So is there regional variation in this influence? What are the longitudinal and socioeconomic patterns that may explain this persistence or decline of this kind of AV effect? in the same 1940s, 1970s. So my hypotheses are that one, uh, census divisions with older housing stock, stagnant or declining population and home ownership in the central city between 1910 and 1930 will see lower FHA activity than those with newer, larger growth in these categories. Uh, two, overall, the effects of an AV grade will positively contribute to the relative home value and ownership increase in the city or uh, home value and home ownership levels in the city with some belts in west coast cities seeing the largest effect while there might be a smaller effect in areas with older housing stock um, in cities with high higher existing uh, shares of non-white populations the impact of these ab grades will be smaller because of this kind of existing racial zoning and um, i argue that these effects will all of these effects will decline over time as the importance of FHA lending declines over time in this period. And then three, um, the extent of persistence or decline of the AV grade effects will also depend on essentially the same economic and racial dynamics and hypothesis. Quick question. Yes. Um, is, it, is it right to assume that like there's been existing work on number, work already on number two, to a lesser extent number one, and like number three, I haven't seen anything written um is that correct or not it's not a lot of uh nobody has right i didn't really talk about the kind of the existing literature but nobody's really studied this kind of regional variation right most people study um the kind of the negative impacts of redlining so they're looking they're kind of focusing on looking at a d or a c grade and kind of doing a comparison of kind of the um kind of like the negative effects of those grades right so i propose to kind of flip the analysis to kind of focus on these kind of better graded neighborhoods. Because I think this is actually the main mechanism that we care about. Um, I have a whole spiel about why I don't think these redlining grades actually were that meaningful in terms of kind of negatively impacting neighborhoods. I don't think these neighborhoods really had the opportunities to get these types of loans to begin with. Um, and so I think it's, it's both, um, I would say that not, not, none of these questions have been extensively studied. Um, and then just to kind of quickly go over the results, um, the, for number one, Pacific and West Coast, uh, West, South Central, which is basically the Sunbelt Census Division had the most new housing construction, and they also had the highest percentage of FAG loans. Uh, two, um, kind of consistent, there was consistent benefit for home value and home ownership to A and B graded neighborhoods in West Coast uh, Mountain Division and some uh, essentially, again, Sunbelt cities. Uh, number three, um, Pacific and Sunbelt cities contribute to this kind of persistence of AB grade. And it's only in the South where we see kind of a lessening or a flattening of the importance of this kind of AB grade persistence. Uh, with it when uh, uh, there's a kind of higher non-white population. Although I will say that the results are a little. Okay. Um, so in terms of the, um, so in terms of the analysis, number one is essentially a descriptive analysis. I'm looking at um, 1910 to 1930 census data. And I'm also looking at FHA insurance activities by state. Number two estimates the fixed effect of an AB grade on home value and home ownership by city. And here I'm gonna be using a Bayesian hierarchical model so that we have these kind of city level coefficients that are drawn from the same underlying distribution. And number three regresses the persistence of AB grade fixed effects on some explanatory variables. Um, quickly, I'm using census data. It's cross, it's gonna be from, uh, the, the main data set's gonna be from 1930 to actually uh, 1970. 
Um, and I'm using 1940 as a, as a baseline. Um, I'm also looking at 1% uh, if um, um, census microdata and then for part one of the analysis and also looking at a mortgage lending report from 1934 to 1940. Uh, do you wanna hear about the census crosswalk or should we kind of skip this technical detail for now? Skip it, okay. Um, also using the HLC map. And then I'm only using tracks that have a 25% grade coverage or greater um, with a single categorization. And so the only kind of slightly unusual bit of, of method that I'm using here is this Bayesian analysis for part two. So the decision to do this analysis kind of stems from the fact that these federal policies were implemented locally. So at the federal level, we have this underwriting manual that is a national guideline. However, we know these policies were implemented by local banks and realtors who made kind of valuation and lending decisions based on their local conditions. And so we have this um, Asian framework. And so I'm using the A and B HOLC grades and I measure their, how their effects vary across cities while allowing information about these effects to be shared between cities. Um, okay. So in this kind of hierarchical regression model, um, this, this is the model specification. So for each time period, I wanna measure some housing outcomes. So here I'm focusing on home value and home ownership. And I'm interested in this kind of fixed effect of an A or B grade after I control for socioeconomic and racial factors. So for each city C and for each time period T, uh, so this beta CT is a vector of coefficients that are my controls uh, with the regression, including some M number of covariates, including for instance, um, population density, race, et cetera, in matrix X. Um, so this I um, grade is gonna be an indicator variable for whether a tract is uh, graded A or B. And this gamma CT is my AB grade fixed effect for uh, city C and time period T. And so this is what I'm call, gonna call my stratification coefficients. And this is the main um, coefficient of interest. So I'm gonna compare its magnitude across cities and also kind of analyze how it varies over time. Um, so because these coefficients are gonna be partially pooled across cities, I assume that they're again kind of drawn from a normal distribution of parameters. That's this um, mu beta, uh, mu beta sigma beta mu gamma sigma gamma. Sorry. Is this HLM or OLM? This is a this is hierarchical. Okay. I'm sorry. What's the, the gamma y? Oh, what's that? So this this is just the this is just the error term. Okay. Sorry, the gamma y. You mean this one or? Yeah. Yeah. That's just error. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that my outcomes are normally, normally distributed. This is going to determine, this is going to determine the mean of my distribution. And then this, this is just the, um, and the grade is a track level or? Yes, the grade is, the grade is track level. For the third part of my analysis, I'm essentially just, what, so what I call grade effect persistence, I'm essentially just averaging these gammas across uh, three, well, I'm averaging how much this gamma term changes from 1940. So for 1950, 1960, 1970, I see how it changes from the baseline and I'm just averaging across three decades. Okay, so that's the so in terms of some of the uh, results, so table one here, or this table shows the extent of the FHA activity in the period um, uh, between 1935 and 1940 and kind of relates it to the census data. Um, so first we see again that the Pacific and Southwest Central have a larger percentage of housing stock built after 1910. So I'm also looking at, so that's kind of this here. I'm also looking at the proportion of FHA guarantees on existing loans 
which I assume to be primarily in the central city areas of this period, and dividing that by the total number of city central city dwelling units. And these percentages are, again, higher kind of in the areas that I'm um, most interested in. Um, and then this kind of goes for essentially total FHA total loans, which is existing and new loans for the metro area. But just keep in mind that this metro area also kind of includes the suburbs. So I uh, kind of expected these, these percentages to be high for kind of my West Coast and Sun Belt cities. But um, this was kind of the surprising, uh, this, these were kind of the surprising results that they're also kind of higher for central city areas. So I think this confirms um, hypothesis one that we do see these kind of higher, uh, higher percentages of loans for um, the areas I'm interested in. But they're high in relative terms, but they're lower than I expected in absolute terms. So just so I'm understanding, like yeah. the large literature on redlining is, is focused on like the effects of maybe a 4% four, 4 of the loans being channeled through these these yeah. graded, you know, in this graded regime, right? Like, because because I just didn't know that it's really kind of a a small proportion of total loans that we're talking about. It's a larger proportion. I I want to say it's something like forty percent oh. at the high point. But this is keep in mind. This is just activity for five periods, and this Got is it. when the FHA yeah. first started. Got so it. So it increases, it increases over time. Really. Yeah. So the bulk of their guarantee activities was really in the 40s and 50s and 60s kind of starting to decline in like the late 60s and into the 70s. That makes sense. Thanks. I'm sorry, I have just another clarification sure. question. But it's on the two right hand, the two rightmost variables, percent FHA existing loan, is percent meaning like, okay, that's the, the fraction or is it percent all in the numerator, which is I don't quite understand how they interpret the variable. So, sorry, I, this is like maybe not like, a, like the clearest um, description of this. So this is the, the, the volume, the number of FHA, uh, FHA guarantees that they made for existing loans in this area divided by the volume of the total number of dwelling units. So it's the number divided by the number. And I'm assuming that I'm comparing, you know, kind of two of uh, the same area, essentially, right, and kind of in the center. So this is kind of like my uh, this is the, the column that I care about for the central city, and this is the whole kind of metropolitan region. Okay, so, sorry, but just to be sure. Uh, so the numerator is the total number of loans issued in that time period to properties in the city limits or something. That's the numerator. Yes, it's yes. It's not like the percent that are also guaranteed or something. It's just like the total loans. The total number of guaranteed loans that the FHA yeah. issued for for this time period. And this was by, you know, by, by census data. So in terms of the results for number two, first, I just kind of want to show what the data looks like when we stratify by, by grade. So this blue line here are kind of uh, census characteristics over time for A and B graded neighborhoods. And this magenta line is the C graded neighborhood. And this is between 1930 and, uh, seven, 1930 and 1970. So we can see that for the most part, Part, the census characteristics, this is percent home ownership, home value, um, college education, non-white percentage. They're for the most part um, pretty stratified kind of before and during the, the period. Okay, so um, this forest plot, shows the kind of the city level city level posterior probability distribution so of what uh, of these kind of stratification coefficients this is just for um, this is just for home value here um, the i don't know if you can see these but the thinner line is the 95 percent credit credible interval and then this kind of thicker line is the kind of the, the middle 50 percent of the distribution um, so all the outcomes uh, and the covariates are standardized for each city and each decade 
so that we can do uh, both cross-sectional and longitudinal comparison. Um, so one thing that we should see about these values is that they're always positive for all cities and all decades, and they're all very statistically unlikely to be zero. Um, this, I don't know if you can see, but this um, x-axis really ends at um, like 0.5 or 0.25 um, for all of these coefficients. Um, Are you able to tell that they're significantly different from each other? Like, you know, sometimes if you, like if you use a random intercept or random slope, you can say, yes, like there is significant difference at the city level. Yeah. Do you know if you can say that definitively here? Yeah, so it's not really clear in this uh, in this picture here, but um, there is like this green line, there is a green line that kind of represents the average uh, across all cities. Yeah. I'll do an analysis that kind of shows how whether or not they are statistically from different each from each other, yeah. or rather by region if they're different from okay. each other. Um, however, this is kind of just like giving you a sense of where like the, this is now looking at persistence, but kind of giving you a sense of kind of which cities had the kind of highest persistence of AB effects um, for both home value and Home ownership. Um, they Wait, are. We only have five minutes left oh. in the room, so I just want to make sure you get a chance to get through your. Talk. Okay. All right. Um, I'll skip this slide, but essentially, you know, kind of the, these effects are declining over time. Um, so when we do, when I do a regression analysis on these kind of average effects by division, we can see that the Pacific division kind of positively contributes ten percent. Uh, and 12, 25% respectively for both home value and home ownership persistence and A and B grades. Um, other, uh, other, other divisions like the Southwest Central or Mountain Division also kind of positively contributes, but it's less. So generally these results confirm hypothesis two that there is a regional division of persistence of importance of these A and B grade designations. Um, so this gets a little bit uh, hairy, but I kind of wanted to understand what are the kind of drivers of this persistence. And so here I'm essentially regressing those kind of uh, persistence, city level persistence uh, uh, statistics against um, some uh, pre-FHA and during FHA kind of census, uh, census information. The, the, the thing that I'll highlight here is that kind of contrary to what I expected, um, there is a pos there's a positive, overall positive relationship between a, an increase in the number uh, and the percentage of non-white population during this period and the importance of um, home value or home ownership, I mean, in this case, home value, whereas, whereas I expected that to be uh, negative. Uh, however, um, when I'm, and here I'm just looking at home values, but when I disaggregate that regression into um, different regions, it seems that for all, for most regions, um, that's the Midwest, that's the South, this is the Northeast, and that's the West. For most other regions, a higher increase in uh, Black population in uh, between 1910 and 1930, either didn't matter or it increased the importance of the persistence of this AB effect. Whereas only in the South do we see a uh, larger, um, larger Black population contribute to a decreased importance of this kind of persistence, of this AB persistence in home value. This is the, um, this is the same kind of persistence uh, plotted against the percentage of non-white residents in 1940. And this relationship basically disappears by uh, 1940 to 1970. So one interpretation of these results could be that when we disaggregate by regions, um, in fact, these kind of pre-existing racial zoning, Jim Crow, kind of other more explicitly racial segregation measures in the South kind of contributed to the decrease importance of these um, of these redlining grades. So um, 
what can we conclude? Basically, there is a larger benefit to uh, home ownership and home values in these A B graded neighborhoods in the West Coast and Sun Belt cities. An increase in non-white residents between 1910 and 1930 and 1940 reduces the importance of this A B effect on home values in the South. This is not true for um, anywhere else in the country. In most other places in the country, these cities exhibit a more, I'd say, intuitive interpretation between race and AD persistence, whereas the presence of non-white populations increases the importance of kind of having to, um, increases the importance of these AD grades over time. And um, obviously, and these are kind of cities that didn't have this kind of historically large black population pre-1940 and these kind of more racially explicit uh, housing policies. So I'm gonna uh, end it there. <laughs> more questions? Yeah, just a few more. <laughs> no one's coming yet to come in okay. the room, but I know they're coming soon. Okay. Please feel free and ask any questions, although I think you took most of them in the course of your time. <laughs> no, it's great. I feel like it's really helpful for me because um, because it's like not always clear to me like what's clear and what's not clear for you all. So um, happy to have um, have all the questions. Yeah. So I have actually loads of questions because this is fantastic and I find it so interesting. We'll have to check them on the side. But one I wanted to bring up now is that the timing of this uh, of redlining coincides also with the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. And I wonder also if that's, I mean, analytically, could that be a different like treatment effect to look at? Because in migrants are going to be non-incumbent local homeowners. So they'd be more likely in the market. But also just like, how do you see your story intersecting with migration as well uh, of really migrants? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think I will say that um, I think a lot of these processes are spatially visible. So again, kind of uh, with my like bigger hypothesis that I actually don't think like FHA redlining really mattered all that much. Like I don't think like a D grade in you know the, the south side of Chicago like really matter that much in terms of like denial of mortgages because there were just a lot more factors that would have prevented them from getting mm -hmm. like new homes in those places. Um, so I think that if we kind of thinking about kind of the great migration as potentially kind of people moving into like the black belt or kind of west coast parts or sorry west uh, like west side parts of the city in Chicago or like in Los Angeles and kind of more central parts of the city. I think that's a spatially disparate process than maybe what I'm talking about here, which like, if you remember from that Chicago map, are these kind of like areas of newer construction in the peripheral areas of the city. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just riffing on this now. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, one of my thoughts was like, for example, uh, the different regions and in particular different cities will have different connectivities to places that were exports of migrants or immigrants mm -hmm. from the disproportionate from the South. Yeah. And so like, you know, you could, uh, you know, so some of these stories are about like new housing being built, but some of them also could be looked at in terms of uh, like the access of immigrants from the South into those different, into those different cities. And that's probably driving some of the, uh, some of like these regional effects as well. Yeah. And I was thinking about this, I mean, I was thinking about it both from an analytical standpoint of like, okay, you could think of like, this is a place that maybe was on the train line from, yeah. you know, the South and that wasn't or something, that'd be an analytical one. But also just like the, the larger kind of the story that's being told of like, um, you know, this was also the sorting of newcomers to cities mostly. And so like an access to capital and location of settlement would be like, like to me just, I was kind of interested in like how that story comes together. Yeah. But it's bad, man. Yeah, we can talk about this very exciting stuff. It's, it, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, I I feel like I I wish there was like more like more data. And, um, yeah.
probably you know there's like something to do with like the um like the 1940 census data. I don't have an answer for you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you the next month. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much and for your patience. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. and Unfortunately, I 